Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us on this sunny afternoon. Um, it's fantastic that we've uh, actually got somebody from Guernsey. So we've we've gone offshore. So welcome to our participants from from Guernsey. Um, I'm not surprised we've got a really great panel today. Uh, a real variety of experience. Um, and uh, I, th I think it's going to be a really useful session. Um, just, I think, just want to wait just a little moment before we get too far started, so there's a few more people to join. But um, perhaps if I start off with the introductions as if they were needed. Um, first of all, we have Fiona Basher, who is the Executive Director of Jersey Childcare Trust, um, a well-known long-standing charity. Um, and uh, <laughs> Lynn's waving to me, so I've probably forgotten something. But I probably should say you can um, use a live chat. That's probably what she's reminding me about uh, along the meeting, and you can include your questions. So back to introductions. Everybody can hear me. Um, then we've got, as I say, we've got Fiona from Jersey Child Care Trust. We've got uh, Mike Pelferman um, from Hospice, who's uh, been in the island now for um, almost a year. Um, so it's great to have Mike join us. It's great to have Mike in Jersey. And then finally, another person who probably needs no introduction whatsoever, uh, Ben Shenton, who's president of Age Concern Jersey, president of Jersey Society of the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, and chairman of the JLA, the Jersey Lifeboat Association. So all his positions are honorary. So we've got a great variety. Sorry, I kind of went offline there, apologies. I hope nobody's, everybody was still there. I suddenly disappeared. Um, your wishes nearly came true. So let's get straight down to business. Um, we've got some questions for the panel, and then, as I say, we'll be welcoming questions from, from all of you later on in the in the event. But I wanted to just kick off with some questions just to get the get the thing going. So I'm going to start with Fiona. Um, we talked about the relationship between um, between government and and the charity sector. And Fiona, do you? As a starter, do you think that the government fully recognises the value that charities play in island life? Well, I think my answer is a yes, but <laughs> I do. I genuinely do think that those in government recognise fully our value and the role we play in island life. And my but will come. So I thought I'd start with the, the reasons why I think they do recognise us and our value. Um, I think that the commissioning based relationship that government has with charities is is maturing. Um, it can vary across different departments, but it's it's maturing and it means that we are in a in a very open, clear relationship with government when we're providing a commission based service for them and with them. I also think that government have set up some cluster groups. Um, I'm on the children's cluster group, and that's a really close way of government and charities being able to communicate about various matters. I know there's others around mental health, there's another one around homelessness. And I also think that with the new CEO, Suzanne Wiley, I think that there is, is real potential there for hopefully government to organise itself better, um, to hopefully uh, establish um, a more trusting employee employer relationship, which I think has been lost over the last few years. And I, and I suppose that comes down to my butt then. Um, so at the Jersey Child Care Trust, for example, we provide services for children with disabilities to go to nursery. Without us, without our charity, children with disabilities would not be able to access education until they start school. So that service is statutory in many other areas of the world. The UK, it's, it's, it's a given. It's, it's something the government provide. 
over here it's it's down to a charity and and i really think um the relationship that we have with government really the success of what we do in that relies on that good relationship with government and and the way i looked at it and thought about it was it's almost a symbiotic relationship so we're providing services for the government to enable children to access nursery and education but without the government's therapeutic services what we provide isn't really worth much so there's this real reliance on both parties for that to be good um, and I think when I'm talking about sort of alluding to a new CEO I'm thinking about how things have changed in terms of um, how it feels to be a government employee we've seen a number of employees leave government in the last couple of years and that's had a really huge direct impact on us as a charity the relationships that we formed with government are lost the knowledge um, the history the experience that we had with those key relationships have gone as well and that's really impacted on us as a charity so i'm hoping that as we go forward that people working in government will have a better deal um, will feel that they're able to trust their employer more and remain with their employer and feel they're, they're working in a more um, collaborative, good environment so that hopefully we can re-establish some relationships and, and have a better working future with government. Thank you, Fiona. Well, I should just say advance notice, Suzanne Wiley will be speaking at our AGM. So another incentive to come along to our AGM on the 14th of July. Um, Perhaps I could ask Ben to sort of deal with that question as well. Ben, what, what do you what do you think? Do you think the government recognise the value? Sorry, just unmute myself first. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of people that would like to mute me. Um, uh, I think they do recognise it, but I'm not sure that they respect it. Um, with charities, with, with a charity, you're offering something outside of government and you're relying on the goodwill of the individual and the goodwill of the people to support you and fund you. Um, it, charities shouldn't be offered in the things that government should be offering. So we shouldn't be offering services that the, is the government's onus to offer. So we're something extra, we're something in addition, and we're offering something that we're willing to provide. And they should respect that we know what we want to provide and we know how to do it and how to provide it. And this, I suppose the big bugbear I don't like is when government tries to interfere or tries to push a charity down the line that they don't want to go. Or even worse, if the charity is receiving funding, that they use that funding as a, almost like a bully boy type tactic. To perhaps force a charity down a, a road that they don't want to go down, especially if it's government themselves that should be providing service. And what they're doing, instead of respecting the charity and appreciating what it does, using it almost like a sticky plaster for its own shortcomings. And I've come across that over the years because although I'm you know, chairman or president of three charities, I have been involved with the charity sector for a long time and spent time in the state. And I think um, what we've seen over the last few years is um, perhaps a loss at government level of island culture and the special qualities that we have over here um, with regard to how government should work for an island, which is very different to the way government should work in the UK. In the UK, it's a, a massive population, a massive land mass. You can't get down to the personal depths that you can. And on an island and you should treat people with respect and also make sure that you don't interfere too much i'm very fortunate in as much as the three charities i'm involved with don't rely on government funding uh we do do at age concern receive a small amount of funding but um we've received such an onerous contract from them in response to receiving that funding that we're we're going to probably tell them where they can put their contract um, because we don't want them interfering in what we do. We want to get on and do what Age Concern does best, do what the lifeboats do best, and do what the JSPCA do best. And we do have to have working relationships with them. Um, and 
we would like that to be closer, um, especially at a couple of the charities where one the relationship is broken and the other one we would just like a, a slightly better relationship. So there's a lot that the government can do, but they've got to remember that they're they're equals with us. They're not our regulator. They're not in charge of us. They don't decide what we do, and they need to respect us at all times. And I think sometimes that's a, a little bit missing. Thanks, Ben. Because uh, strong words. What, what do you think, Mike, as a newcomer to the island? What's your been your experience? Um, <clears throat> I think if I'm talking from a hospice perspective, I'm very conscious hospice is one of the biggest or bigger charities on island. And I think the answer to the question from my perspective is yes, but we're big enough and, uh, and strong enough to ask for and get that respect. I suspect that I, I'm a yes, but with Fiona, but I suspect the but, the size of the but increases the smaller the charity, I would imagine. Um, and the only other thing I'd say on that is, I, I, I don't think it's just government. I wonder actually if the general population of Jersey really recognises the, the value the charity sector brings to the island and whether there is more through your good services, Kevin, we could even be doing collectively to push that. So, so yeah, I'm a yes, but. Okay. Well, I, well it's a good that we've got a yes. Um, and uh, I, I, I suppose if I could add, I just think, um, in many cases, I think we have seen a big improvement. I've sort of seen people like Paul McGuinnessy working very hard to try and cer certainly help um, connect us. But I think there's always more work to do. And we've got a new chief executive in Suzanne Wiley. She's kindly agreed to come and talk at the AGM. And I think, you know, I heard her speak about the role of charities in the island. And I know that, you know, with... Uh, one big initiative government have got on is about you know encouraging more volunteers so i think i feel like she she gets it but i think um i i do understand what ben's saying i think perhaps <coughs> sometimes there's not a recognition of the size of the charity to cope with the complexity of the bureaucracy we all want to treat taxpayers money in a correct way but sort of sometimes it can be quite overwhelming and and it, in my experience over the years has sometimes been quite a long process when, when there's urgent things to deal with. Okay, um, as I say, you can, um, you can add your comments, you can add your questions in the chat box for people who joined, joined us. So um, we hope you'll, uh, you'll have a view about that. For, this, for the second question, I'm gonna come back straight back to you, Mike. And, um, ask a, another question is about what your what your big concern is for the charitable sector in Jersey just looking at hospice but perhaps more broadly okay thank you uh, and just to say it, yes I, I I am 10 months in fact on island so I don't hold myself out to be an expert on all things Jersey at all so feel free to disagree with me um, I was just reflecting having worked 30 years in the voluntary sector in the UK there are 180,000 charities in the UK and there's a general rec widespread recognition. There are too many, there's too much duplication, et cetera. Many were teetering before COVID and even more are teetering now. And I came to Jersey and what is it about 400 charities? And I thought, gosh, that's a, a much more sensible number. Uh, and then of course I worked it out as a proportion of the population. And actually Jersey has more charities per head of population than the UK. So I don't quite know what that says. And I've seen, and I'm, I'm not suggesting for a minute, some of our 400 charities are not doing a great job and I've seen some great work being done. But I guess my two principal areas of concern, one is funding, probably no surprise, um, and funding that is, is more sustainable and more committed, isn't just one or four, one year only. Um, I think every charity needs to have that uh, assurance uh, for other reasons I'll come on to in a second. Now, wh where's that income coming from? Well, potentially a range of sources, but two potentially predominantly. One is government, we're clearly short of any major changes around tax and spend policies. The pot is finite. Uh, and then there's fundraising, where I, I certainly feel there's more to be gained from a range of sources like legacies, affluent individuals on island and the financial sector. But it's a small island of 100,000 odd population. And I suspect with things like 
events and other community fundraising, we may be seeing a glass ceiling being hit. So, um, so I think I think that's definitely an area of concern for the future. The, the other I would just pick out is regulation across a number of areas. Um, uh, and I think it's undoubtedly worse in the UK. They've been making things worse for a considerable time, but is there a danger Jersey will follow suit? Whether it's the Jersey Charity Commission, which is still relatively new but and, and relatively undemanding, but if it goes the way of the UK, it may not be. Jersey Care Commission for those in the health sector, um, commissioning expectations, Ben just referred to that, are they going to tighten? Um, uh, data protection, goodness me, whether it's delivering services or fundraising or whatever, that's a huge burden, accounting rules, HR employment law, um, all of those are increasingly demanding a level of resource and expertise so you don't fall foul, but um, those professionals often will cost um, and many charities can't afford that. So, you know, how do we deal with that? And I suppose that then leads on to my final point, which was that um, uh, it seems to me, both in the UK and Jersey, many charity staff and volunteers who actually have a real expertise in the delivery of the service are spending so much time either on regulation, on paperwork, on fundraising, that actually they're not putting their time and efforts where their strengths really lie and the charity and the beneficiaries end up losing out as a result. Um, so I'm not offering any answers on this at the moment. Maybe I'll have one or two in a second, but I think for me, those are the two main concerns, funding and regulation. Thanks, Mike. Uh, do you want to take uh, the, that, Ben, take that challenge, that, that second question, the big concern for the sector? I think um, one of the bigger concerns in some respects is, is something that the, the charities themselves have brought upon themselves. Um, I think that there is a lack of volunteers, or it's very difficult to get volunteers. And I suppose it, it goes back to um, when I was a, a politician, there was there was talk at one time about means testing political pay. So you could end up with a situation where you're in a meeting with another politician who's been paid to be at the meeting and, and someone else who isn't paid to be at the meeting and uh, it caused the faction. Um, the, the charity sector has grown and we have now professional fundraisers with a number of charities out of necessity, um, partly because perhaps some funding from government isn't being made when it should be. But when you move to professional fundraisers and then start paying staff um, in shops and, and in other areas where historically you've had volunteers, you do tend to then get a problem with volunteers coming forward if they're going to be doing the same work as someone else on an unpaid basis as someone on a paid basis. Similarly, if you've got professional fundraising, they tend to suck up a lot of the, the money that's available. There's only a, a finite pot of what people will give to charity. And if you if you have a professional fundraiser, especially if you have them with charities that actually don't need the money, and there are some charities that over here with very strong balance sheets and too much money, in my opinion. So they're raising money just to put in the bank. Um, I think you, you are going to get the problem that you have because people are less likely to volunteer here if uh, if they're helping out in a shop where half the staff are paid and half aren't. So the, the professionalism that we've seen or the, the move towards the professionalism within the charity sector has perhaps had an impact on the number of volunteers um, that's coming forward. And furthermore, I think people are just, I, I don't know, I, I mean, we, it was touched upon before just to see a number of charities, I mean, and just the sheer number of fundraising efforts um, on a small island like this it's found to be detrimental I mean obviously I'm involved with three charities I'm delighted when someone donates to us so I'm I'm sort of saying there's too many charities and then I'm chairing three of them um, and uh, so it is a difficult dilemma because every charity does a, a very good job and, and they're different sizes but I think if you move more towards the model of everyone in the charity becoming very professional and very paid 
And part of that will come through more government regulation where you've got to employ more staff. So if you, if you take a, a charity like the JSPCA, in the old days you might run it quite simply, but now you've got to make sure that you have all the staff in place to, to cover all the numerous laws and rules and regulations on a daily basis, not just from the point of view of uh, finance and um, so on and so forth, but the animal welfare rules, rules of environmental health and everything else. So it's a much more onerous um, thing to run a charity these days. And the costs have gone up and we are seeing increasingly charities turn into small businesses. Businesses and people are less likely to volunteer for a small business. So, I mean, lack of volunteers is, is, is a massive thing, and I'm not sure what the government can do about it. And certainly, what the government shouldn't be doing, which is what I read in the paper the other day, is, is start moving into the charity sector themselves and filling what historically had been uh, staffed by volunteers by more government employees. Okay. Well, some strong, <laughs> some very strong comments there. I think if I could just respond before I ask um, Fiona to finish up, I think one of the things we all want to see is um, is charities becoming more professional, that's for sure. But I think that what we are hearing and we're sort of seeing it quite often is that there's definitely a struggle for volunteers. And that seems to have been a sort of post-COVID and, you know, uh, the the information that I saw, the last survey I saw was 45% of people in the island did some volunteering, which I thought was an incredible statistic. Um, but I think trying to encourage some younger people to volunteer because it generally is the over, the slightly older people in our community. So initiatives around the corporates to encourage people to do some volunteering, I think is good for them and good for the organisation. As to competition among charities I guess that's there's competition among everything but I think certainly to fundraise to deal with any unnecessary regulation I would agree with you that it would be unfortunate. Fiona what, what would, what's your view? I was just thinking about the regulation point that Ben was raising actually and just um, you know coming from a children's world um, and thinking about the safeguarding agenda that that's one of the areas that I just really would push for more regulation actually we currently have no regulation that demands of charities that we DBS check our employees and so or, or volunteers and so we have charities at the moment that are providing you know placements for for people to do volunteering or, or work placements young people who potentially could be working with people who haven't had DBS checks as a, a very bare minimum um, and so you know that's one area of regulation I would really want to see Jersey getting hold of um, hopefully our charity commissioner seeing that as part of their remit so that when you become a regulated charity you can prove that you are safeguarding children in, the, in that very basic way um, anyway going back to your um, original question so greatest concern for the charitable sector in Jersey for us we've seen a 30 percent increase in the last 12 months of the needs of children and families in the island we see more and more people sinking into poverty and we see the growth of need in our community escalating beyond anything we could have imagined possible um, this year. I mean, that was a 30 percent increase last year on the year before this year. Our numbers are up to the number of children we supported last year. We're already up to that number now in six months in. So we know that we're going to be probably doing at least double the number of children and families and helping them this this year. So in terms of <clears throat> our greatest concern, it's, it's actually the pressures on us as a charity and whether we're going to be able to cope with that massive growth in such a very short period of time. Okay. So I suppose just to summarize there, we, we've got the continuing funding need for charities, which you've all identified in order to provide the services we need to find the money to provide those services and some of it will come through paid staff. I think Fiona's made a big point is that as things get more difficult, we're going to see more demands on charities. And we've probably actually seen that over COVID, haven't we, really, as to the demands that have been made. Finding people to either volunteer or service staff members seems to be another concern that 
members have expressed to us is just finding people. And I think that's an island wide issue. Um, preferably, it's great to have volunteers and I think volunteers get a lot out of it, but I think certainly charities are telling us that um, finding volunteers, so initiatives to encourage more. And Ness, we're all in favour of necessary regulation. And you know, so there's no doubt about that. It's just making sure that regulation is tested to make sure it's appropriate and as easy to deal with. It's not about, it's making sure the results are the right results rather than the process to get it sort of. Um, so quite a lot, quite a lot on charities plates at the moment, clearly, if ever that, that was not the case. Um, okay. Um, ben, what, you've heard all this, you've got your own views. Um, what, what do you think the one thing that government could do to support the sector more widely? Um, I, I think it um, basically could, I mean, it, it, with, with different charity hats on, we have had very good communication channels with certain areas of the states of Jersey. Um, but I feel that uh, perhaps that we could become a little bit more involved and point out the, the problems that we have and perhaps just take on board the frustrations that we have. And they could do that in sort of a tiny way. So if I use a couple of examples, um, age concern. Um, we, uh, I was down to Nobens the other day and Ports of Jersey have made the parking on the harbour app only. You can't, you can't park down on the harbour now behind the boathouse unless you go on that. So basically they've said to quite a large proportion of elderly people, you can't park here because they can't use smartphones and they don't want to use smartphones. And that's a point that's been raised by Age Concern previously on numerous occasions, but they still go and, and do that. And Broad Street is another issue where the elderly don't, you know, it's quite a long walk down Conway Street from the bus station, not for you or I, um, it's not, but for the elderly it is. And people used to get dropped off in Broad Street and pop along to Marks and Spencer and so on and so forth. And same with the market, people used to get dropped off at the market. And so there's this, and I can understand the movement towards getting cars out of town, but you have to do it in a holistic manner that um, responds to the needs of the community. And we, at Age Concern, we keep raising these issues, but it's like banging your head against a brick wall. So maybe they should just sort of listen a little bit more and, um, and make sure that they fully understand what we're doing, why we're doing it, and the implications of some of the policies that they bring in and how it will affect on the charities. I've no doubt that um, in my role as an investment manager that we are going to hit an economic downturn over the next couple of years. And this will do two things. Firstly, it will increase the call on our resources um, of the charities sector. And secondly, it may well limit the amount of funding that we get. So perhaps there should be some sort of, I, I, I don't know, emergency funding solution, or they should start talking to us now and saying to us, look, we know that you're going to get increased pressures. Um, uh, you know, certainly Fiona's charity is, is going to get more and more pressures on it. We know this is going to happen. Rather than wait for it to happen and then panic. Why don't we start talking to you now about how you're going to cover those funding pressures for essential services if you have a shortfall in funding, which you may well have, because if, if you have an economic downturn, people are less likely to, to give to the charity sector because they're more interested in feeding themselves and paying their rent and, and keeping themselves going. So it's sort of looking ahead and saying, economic downturn coming, let's chat to the charity sector, let's see how we're going to get through that. And, I, and up to now, I don't think there's ever been even a thought of doing something as sensible as that. So that's the sort of thing I'd like to see. Listen better and be more agile and, 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 un and understand the benefits that the sector can provide, of which there are many. 
Yeah, but basically look, look, look ahead and uh, instead of react to the situation. So with age concern, we've had a situation last week where we were used to react to the fact that there's a lack of hospital beds being freed up. Um, and it took us by surprise, but maybe just make sure that you know there's you know there's going to be a downturn you know there's going to be an increase in children's charities um, and the needs on that there may well be a, a lot more animals disclaimed which will hit the animal charity you know have that conversation now rather than make this happen okay thanks ben um fiona do you want to take that what's the one thing um so the one thing thing for me is that actually the difference that we make in our charity is completely dependent upon how well government works we are completely reliant either way they are on us and we are on them um and just you know thinking more about you're saying for government to listen more i would say individually individuals do listen and I think that they also do agree with what we say, but there's almost this paralysis in government as, a, as, a, as an entity that they're working within, where there's this lack of accountability of, of who has made the decision or, or who can make something happen. It almost, um, when I think of charity and I think of how we work and how we've worked in, in, during COVID, you know, our charity was agile, it was responsive, it was flexible. The team were always thinking about, we've identified this need, how can we make a difference? What can we do differently to make that work in these restrictive times? When I think of government and how we've been working with government recently, as a result of COVID and the pressures that that's bringing on, on us all, government are almost paralyzed and, you know, our sit-in, meetings with government um, representatives and and they'll say please you know make these points of um, issue that you have really well known please make complaints to the government to to our superiors tell them the impact of us not being able to provide this service um, so the individuals are listening and they're agreeing with us but they almost are stuck in terms of being able to make a difference at the moment that sounds really negative. Sorry. I know. So, the, so the so the people are there. It's always about people, isn't it? But sometimes the organisation can't react quickly enough. Yes. Um, and if it's that one thing you want from government, it's it comes back to to the system that you're working in. But it's it's having permission. Government giving their employees permission to make decisions, to make things happen, to remove that red tape and and the blocks that are, are are stopping people from actually doing what they want to do, <laughs> which I know is difficult. It's a huge biggest employer in the island, but um, it's so opposite to how we work in, in charities. And sorry, did you think that's because um, you know, sometimes you hear that you know government is very reluctant to some, some to try things in case mistakes are made and therefore de decisions take a long time to be made you know a sort of cultural thing about getting out there and making a decision and, and fixing it quickly if, if, if it needs to be fixed sort of thing my my thoughts around this at the moment and my experiences are around very basic government services which should be being offered to children and families which aren't being offered at the moment and um creative ways around how to offer them aren't being enabled um so you know really basic stuff that should be happening at an expectation that you would expect from the government to be able to provide certain services just aren't happening um and and individuals are then paralyzed to be able to do something different to make it happen in a different way and we've got some prospective politicians listening today and we've got uh probably some people from, from government listening is, do you think there's anything that we as a sector could do better to get across the issues to government? What is it that we could do rather than just yeah. what they do? So um, one example is at the moment, Jersey just does not have enough speech and language therapists. And this is one example of, of many. Um, 
And a government official came in to us at the Jersey Child Care Trust and said, the, the feel that you get when you walk in here of you as an employer is entirely different to the government. It's an entirely different way of working and it's an entirely different value system and ethos. This would be very attractive to people to work in. And actually, as we, as we began talking, we thought of creative ways of how we could get children and families, children to access speech and language therapists by actually, if the government made some funds available to enable us to employ a speech and language therapists to work within the Jersey Child Care Trust, to probably plural, two speech and language therapists, to work across the children that we support, as 150 at the moment, the children say Brighter Futures and other charities who are supporting children at the moment with very real red category speech and language therapy needs, we could make that happen very, very quickly. And we think we would be a much more attractive employer to a speech and language therapist than perhaps working in government. We'd like to try that out. And those are, those are the sorts of creative ideas that officers and us are coming up with to see whether that could happen. Because children, you know, we've got literally a generation of early years children that have not had access to speech and language therapy starting school without any support. Mike, what would, uh, I, I don't what, think what's I, your I, one I, wish? I don't think I have much more to add to that. My, mine is only one potentially small and unworkable practical suggestion as to whether there, whether there's a role for some centrally funded support service that provides all the backup, accountancy, HR, data protection, advice and support that many of the smaller charities need but can't afford, but they can tap into much more cost effectively. Maybe unworkable, but there's, there's one for you to take away, Kevin. Yes. Um, well, I think if we had, um, if there was a demand for that, we'd look at it. We've obviously got to fund it, but and that's always a challenge for well, us. I, I, as I well. would say that's something that would be good use of potential government funds because it will free up a hell of a lot of professionals who are expert in their field to spend time delivering services, not spend time doing all the stuff that isn't really their expertise. But anyway, that's off the cuff thought. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Well, we're doing well from time. We could perhaps look at some of the questions that uh, we've had in the chat, and people can uh, still. We've got, as I say, we've got some time. If if uh, those participating want to leave something in the chat, we can um, we can try and deal with it. So we've got one here from Deputy Pamplin. He's saying, "How how can government help support you and the sector encourage young Islanders the future to get more involved?" Uh, and creating pathways, careers, volunteering with local charities. So how can we encourage, and how, how can government encourage younger people to get to get involved with the, with the charitable sector? Do you want to kick off with that, Ben? Uh, yes, certainly. Um, there's a, a, a new initiative, uh, I think it's called Unity, um, that um, I'm not sure how new it is, but uh, uh, certainly with the JSPCA, um, uh, we've seen quite a few corporates take up the initiative and we've seen a lot of young people come up to the JSPCA to volunteer on corporate days. And this has led to some of them becoming quite sort of involved in charity. I think I think um, with, with the younger generation, it, it's more a case of just sort of making it appealing to them and making sure that when they do turn up that they, they have something meaningful to do and feel like that they're, you know, they're getting something out and putting something back. And of course, you know, um, JSBCA and Age Concern are both beneficiaries of the, the Island Walk, which is taking place this weekend. And this will mainly be young people raising a significant amount of money for charity. We do have a demographics problem, there's no doubt about it. We have a uh, you know, I'm one of the baby boomers and, uh, you know, our generation is getting older and, you know, a lot of people are dropping out of volunteering simply through old age. So we, and we're losing that. But uh, I, I, th I think with regard to getting young people involved, there have been some initiatives quite recently. Uh, I applaud everything the Association Jersey Charities does. Um, and from that point of view, I, 
I, I think it, it is looking up, and I, and I think this, the, the fact that corporates under CSR are now putting something back is a big plus, and that will get bigger and bigger, and more and more young people will get involved with that. Thanks. I mean, I, I think we've we've supported Unity. I think you know that I think that is a really great initiative, and I think it's perhaps getting across to getting across to volunteers the benefits to them of volunteering. It's not just about doing good. I think they. They will get something from it. That's been my experience as a volunteer, and obviously yours, Ben, but and others who volunteer is that you you get as much as you give actually in the longer term. So, um, so I think uh, and gov and to be fair to government, I think they were the the first client of Unity. So um, you know, they let's hope that leads to something quite powerful. Uh, Fiona. Younger people. So um, I was just thinking about some of the volunteers that we have who volunteer with us and, and we have a range of different roles and one of them is actually going into nurseries and helping children sort of become engineers um, and it's a lovely way that corporates can get involved with with children in nurseries and, and actually at the same time see our programs running. And just some of the some of the responses from those that have done that, you know, they've gone from a boardroom and their desk into a setting into nurseries and they've gone in shaking like leaves and they've come out 10 times taller with, you know, they just completely thrilled with what they've done and what they've achieved and the interactions they've had with children, which is a very grounding, leveling experience for them. Um, and each one of those volunteers have gone back and told their colleagues who have then signed up to the next one. Um, I think I think we have a, a real challenge in Jersey in terms of two, uh, you know, younger people getting involved with volunteering. Actually, unless it's supported by your employer, we've got a generation of people who are struggling to afford the cost of living at the moment. And so we have, by and large, well, we have the highest rate of working women in, in the developed world. Um, so the majority of our younger people are working um, full time and more to be able to afford to live in Jersey. Um, and so whilst you've got employers supporting and doing some release through employment, that's superb. I wonder whether we'll see less uh, people with less free time to be able to volunteer in their own time going forwards. Yeah, that is a very, very good point. Um, Mike, you, lose, you use lots of, require, rely on lots and lots of volunteers at hospice. I mean, how do we get more young, do you, are they of a certain age? Am I allowed to say that? Um, I couldn't quote a precise figure, but I'm pretty sure it's um, over 75% or over 75 or something to that effect. Wow. So, uh, or, or thereabouts, but so, certainly uh, not enough young people. And look, I don't, I don't know enough about exactly what happens on Jersey generally. Um, certainly in terms of things I've done before at previous hospices and other hospices I've seen in the UK, I'm... I'm keen at some point to explore apprenticeship or, or those type of schemes that enable young people to get a grounding into care roles, clinical roles, even finance, even fundraising. Um, and that's certainly what I'd like to look at, what government does do and therefore could do on the back of that. I'm not sure I'm equipped to answer. Okay. We had a question from Helen Miles about the extent the government were uh, that charities were involved in in strategy development for government. I mean, I'm, I see that you're uh, not sure everybody saw that, Mike, but uh, your response. But uh, what what do panelists think about that? Um, us being in uh, uh, charities being in at an early stage and how you actually do that because I suspect it's a desirable thing to do, but it's how do you actually do it? Ben. Um, I, th I think we are, um, if I use assisted dying as, a, as, a, as an example, um, Age Concern was consulted over assisted dying um, right from the very beginning. And, and we, we are in regular dialogue with the, the government about getting the message across about how it's going to work. What, we, when, what was very important was we didn't take a stunt on assisted dying. We were under pressure by some members who were against it and some members who were in favour of it. But we didn't feel it was our job 
take a stance on it. But our, our role was more to make sure that if the states did pass it, to make sure that the legislation itself is fit for purpose and is sympathetic to the needs of the elderly generation that, that we represent. And the, the dialogue there is, is is pretty good. So that's that's a that's a very good example. But then, and I won't actually mention exactly in what way, but in other charities, we've had quite difficult relationships with the government. So it's a little bit like you could always say, it's good in parts, um, but it, it could be better. But personally, quite often, I like to be left alone and just get on with stuff. And I, I don't prepare particular fan of having long meetings and lots of discussions about something. I'd rather just do it. Uh, okay. And maybe that's why government is as inefficient as it is, because <laughs> they just don't get on with it. So, uh, so I, I wouldn't want, I, you know, I, I'm sure if we need to speak to someone in the government, we know which door to knock on. But quite frankly, most of the time, I'd rather just get on with it. Well, I think one thing is that when we have a new council of ministers, they'll be working on their common strategic priorities as one of the early um, the early pieces of work. And I guess it's up to the sector to make sure that's properly informed, because I think we've got a pretty close to what's going on in the community. Fiona, do you want to pick up on the strategy development? Yeah, um, just an interesting one on Ben's reference then to doors to knock on um just going back to my earlier point around relationships i feel like there's less doors that we can knock on at the moment in terms of who we have as relationships because we've lost some key people um, but that said my next meeting today is with um, somebody in government who is consulting around the the children and young people's plan um, you know it's been several years now in in the running and they're sort of looking at reviewing um, the outcomes and and it's and it's focus so you know as a charity we're being consulted with there um, I do think that the children and family sector as a whole is, is perhaps a more mature sector in terms of being able to be consulted with by government because we've got something called the Best Start Partnership. And so that's about 30 to 35 different organisations from government, private and voluntary sector um, that enable it, that enable government to much more easily have those conversations and, and sort of develop policy together. Um, and there's been some good examples of how that's happened in the past in, in lots of different ways. And, and I totally get Ben's point around just get on with it. Um, we're a bit of a get on with it kind of um, charity ourselves, actually. And, and sometimes it is frustrating. And, and I do feel sometimes you, you do go around a there is a kind of circle. Um, I think I'm probably reaching an age now where I've seen it go around the circle a couple of times. But I, I just feel that it is important to have those conversations and it is important to have those opportunities to, to have that dialogue. Um, I think COVID's kind of got in the way of that a little bit. I think that from a children's policy perspective, things really went to sleep over a good couple of years and they're only just starting to waken up now. So I really hope, you know, my, meeting, my next meeting's a bit promising for where things will go. Thanks, so. I think we're just going to take one more before we let everybody get back to work. Lynn's saying I can't, but I'm going to anyway. And this is uh, just to William Church's one that's in the chat about the approach to business, you know, rather than always asking for money, is that could we, could we ask in a different way? Um, so I guess given that charities are all in competition, they won't want to always share their best ideas, but how can we do a better job with the business sector as, as uh, not just government? Mike, do you want to go with that one? Yeah, sure. I'll have a crack at that. Well, well, I think it's good timing because actually I think more and more, and I think I'm seeing this on Jersey as well as the UK, companies are, and particularly medium to larger companies, are looking to adopt more transparent CSR policies. And a large part of that is about employee involvement. Um, so actually, I think if you're going in potentially talking, you know, find the right people who look after that in the company, but you're pushing at an open door. Um, I mean, government itself has just uh, agreed that, as I understand, that employees can have three paid days a year 
volunteering. Um, many companies are following suit and indeed are looking for volunteering opportunities that also provide a team building opportunity for those staff. So as long as clearly you've got a, a reasonably well thought through volunteering team building opportunity, then I think there's lots of companies out there that want to hear from you. And, and just another good old plug for, for, for Unity sort of thing, yeah, yep. which, I, which I think is a great initiative. Fiona? I was just reflecting when William was asking that question, I was just thinking back to um, a course I went on with lots of charities um, and they were talking about their experiences of volunteer days and there was this farm in the city of London who kept a wall specifically for businesses to come in and paint it and so it would change colour frequently because it meant that businesses were coming in they were you donating some money probably for an experience day um, and volunteering apparently for that organization um, and I suppose my point is around it being meaningful and also using the skill set of people um, rather than having a lawyer or an accountant go in and paint a wall um, perhaps that lawyer or the accountant could give skills to that charity around you know, redeveloping its constitution or perhaps um, doing some treasury services for it. So really sort of honing in on what people's skill set is so that we can get the best value from people that are in the workforce. Yeah, I, that's a great point, I think. It's a, it's a really great point. And then again, back to Unity, I think one of the jobs that they can do is match skills with demand. You know, that's so, so important. Ben, the last word for Ben Shenton, who's a pro left the doghouse on Sunday, as some of, uh, and is still currently the top dog on the on the funding scoreboard. So, yeah, yeah. The, the funny thing, I, I hate asking people for money. That's just a weird thing, and I, I, um, it, it's quite difficult. It depends on the charity, really, because you know JSPCA is a very good charity for getting the corporates involved age concern not so um you know you can't have a group of accountants suddenly turn up and into yeah um as, as age concern i suppose if business uh, yeah i know we're asking for money but if i'm honest with you there's a bigger value on people's time than there is on money and if for example they, they had someone in their finance department and they said oh well we'll carry on paying so and so but you can have it for three hours uh, or five hours a month. Um, so she's sort of quasi volunteering for us while still getting paid. Um, that would be perhaps one way of doing it. It's still down to money at the end of the yeah. day, but then, you know, um, we're, we're, we've got the experts, you know, I'm, I'm not on, I'm on three charities, but I'm not an expert on anything that they do. Um, and so you, you, you need the experts actually within the charity. So you, you can't, um, the, the accountants and the lawyers and so on can't go in quite often and, and replicate what the what the actual experts in the charity are doing. I think that sort of goes to Williams and, and Fiona's point is it's time and expertise really, isn't it? Well, thank you very much, panelists. Thank you very much to everyone that's joined us today. We really appreciate um, you joining us. Um, if uh, there's a plug from, from Guernsey here, that if you want to get in touch with um, please uh, with Guernsey and see how they do it, please uh, email Joni at the Guernsey Community Foundation. But uh, thanks for all that have joined this event. It, it'll go up as a live, um, as a you know the uh, the recording of it will go up on our YouTube channel. So for those who haven't caught up with it, and hopefully particularly po prospective politicians who haven't uh, been able to join us, I know you're busy, um, but we really would like you to hear what has been said today because it's, it's some important stuff has come out so thanks everybody for joining uh, and thanks for your support for for the charities and for the AJC thank you so much <laughs>